Good evening, everybody. My name is Thomas Lamel. I'm the senior uh, program manager of CEU Executive MBA. I will guide you through the evening to this London open day of the CEU Executive MBA program. If you have any questions, be, feel free to ask me here in, on site at Impact Hub London, or feel free to use the chat box on Zoom. We will collect your uh, questions for the Q&A session at the end. Um, we will start with the program presentation um, done delivered by me. We will then, you will have the opportunity to meet current participant Lee and alumni Ekaterina and have a short talk with them about their motivation, why they chose CEU back then. And then we will uh, move on to our um, VIP keynote presentation by Professor y Yusuf Akbar on Joe Biden's antitrust counter revolution. And in the end, we'll have uh, the uh, Q&A session where you, have, you will have the opportunity to ask your questions about the program and any other related issues. So let me get started with the elephant in the room. I just want to place the question out there if an MBA is still worth it. You would have to ask this question to yourself because you don't have to go very far these days um, to encounter that you are witnessing fundamental transformations in the world in a century. In 2015, in 2008, we've had a big financial crisis. In 2015, we've experienced a huge refugee crisis. And even now for more than one, more over than uh, more over a year now, we're experiencing uh, the biggest pandemic in a century. So you would need to understand that these transformations are part of a much broader set of transformation that is going on right now. And some of them are positive, of course, but some of them are pretty dangerous. And the key question is how do we, how do you as business professionals deal with this, with this uh, situation? And how are you able to prepare for this unpredictable environment? And it brings us to the obvious question that I started this presentation with, uh, is an MBA still worth it? And I will use this presentation in order to show you why we think that an executive MBA is still worth it. So if you're interested in further education, you usually start looking for an MBA program in the city where you live in. What you tend to find is mostly a pretty standard, a pretty so-called vanilla MBA curriculum without a philosophy, without a mission-driven approach, uh, without any specific perspective. The faculty who are delivering the program are, in most cases, pretty much local, not very much international. So is the international, so is the student body. It's not very international. It's most of the times it's a very uh, local student body. Some programs in Western Europe tend to be very expensive at the cost of 80,000 or 100,000 euro um, at least and can be quite expensive. But those program, those local programs allow you uh, not to leave your job. If you compare it to the leading business schools in the world, mostly in the US or here in the UK, um, they often have a very differentiated uh, curriculum. They are very mission driven. Um, they are very engaged to a certain perspective or uh, a mission. They, have, they offer a certain expertise in that field. Because of their full-time format, they actually have a very international faculty and a very international student body. But you're leaving the labor market for one or even two years with, with those programs, which is an additional financial burden in addition to, to your tuition. Of course, you have a campus experience, but sometimes you even have to relocate your family because you're one or two years out of the job market because of the full-time program. So what we do at CU is to offer the best of two worlds. There is no work interruption thanks to our flexible, flexible and modular format of the program. I will talk about it later. The executive MBA for the open world is very much mission driven. I will talk about our philosophy, about our mission at a later point in this presentation. We have an international student body. According to the Times of Higher Education, we are the second most international in the world, which shows in our student body. In the current cohort, we have people coming in from five continents, despite of the corona crisis. We have people flying in, commuting to the modules uh, 
from far away, such as Vancouver, Canada, Vladivostok, Russia, India, South Africa. Um, participants can fly out, can fly in. That's a huge, that's a big asset of the program. I already mentioned some of our uh, world-renowned faculty. Um, all of our faculty members come from and teach at the best universities in the world, most of them. Ivy League universities in the US or the best universities here in the United Kingdom. Um, because of big data and artificial intelligence, as you can see here on the picture, will be taught by Miklos Koren, one of the leading scholars in this field in Europe with a PhD from Harvard. If you're new to finance, Joy is a uniquely gifted educator. Generation after generation of our students tell us how she's just unique in explaining complex financial concepts. Faculty co-director Maciej Kieślowski will be uh, teaching as well in the program on regulation, regulatory issues, and non-market strategy. He's got a JSD degree from Yale, an MBA from INSEAD, and an MPA from Princeton. For economics, we have Mark Kaufman, an expert in applied theory with a PhD from, ha from Harvard. For leadership, we have Austin, um, our world-class psychologist with executive education experience on four continents. He will lead the way. We also have uh, Professor Sofia Barani with a PhD from LSE actually. Um, she will talk about the future of work with uh, regards to automation, automation artificial, artificial, artificial intelligence and robotics. And if you're already experienced in finance, you'll be placed in the advanced track course with Adam Sabadowski, a leading expert on complex investments with a PhD from Princeton. And for innovation, you'll have Mike Labelle, um, who holds a prestigious EU Chamonix chair on innovation. Here's some examples of our uh, visiting faculty, Professor Christian Zelos from Stanford, Miklos Savary from Columbia, Omar Hernandez from Berkeley, Professor Hui Chen from the University of Zurich, or Dr. Milena Nikolova, Chief Behavior Officer at Behavior Smart. Hi. Yeah, exactly. Please have a seat. So here's what the program looks like it's a 10 module program. The dates you can see on the screen are not going to change. So you can basically plan your studying around professional and private family activities based on these dates. As you can see, we have three modules in the first year, four modules in the second year, and three modules in the last year. Piggybacking around popular European holidays like November 1st or May 1st or August 15th, when it's easier for you to take time off. In the summers, our bespoke and cutting edge leadership program every summer takes place on Budapest campus and you'll have the opportunity to meet visiting faculty that we fly in for you around the world. So there will come a day when you finish with us and join the CEU alumni network, which is an alumni network of more than 18,000 elite professionals around the world. As I already said, CEU is the second most international university in the world. And this is reflected in the alumni body as well. We have basically chapters everywhere in the world. Wherever you go, we have chapters, local chapters in cities, country chapters, and you have always the opportunity to connect to alumni wherever you go in the world. And thanks to our very American approach, this is a network that you can easily approach to. This network is a network that you can count on, and it's one of the uh, biggest assets that we have. So the question is, how are we able, how are we able to, such a, to, to offer such a program at only 29,000 euros of tuition? And the answer lies in our founder and benefactor, George Soros, who created CEU with the mission to promote open society. Just recently, last year, uh, George Soros added another billion dollars with a B uh, to our financial endowment, which makes us the uh, uh, university with the biggest financial endowment in Europe. And he created the Open Society University Network that you will be part of. 
So what does the executive MBA for the open world actually mean? First of all, when we talk about the open world, we mean skepticism towards dogmas, towards hierarchies and privileges, both in context of how we teach, but also in composition of the cohort. Diversity is key to creating our successful program and not just an empty marketing pitch phrase for us. Secondly, we believe in debate and radical rational thinking. Every idea can be challenged in our courses. We believe in facts and arguments rather than narratives and fake news because it's narratives that create the polarization that we're experiencing on social media these days. We believe that the best way to challenge this narrative-based discourse is to make arguments based on facts and realities, which is the hallmark of Karl Popper's definition of open societies. We are fundamentally opposed to any kind of uh, discrimination and we actively promote diversity within our program. The way we finance the scholarships means we create opportunities for people who traditionally have not been able to actually join executive MBA programs. And one uh, thing that distinguishes us from other programs is that we see our participants not just as managers or as people who deal with resources and businesses, but as positive change agents. Everybody, wherever they come from, whatever their profession is, whatever their professional private background is, can contribute to the open society mission. So what does a typical CEU executive MBA classroom look like? That's actually, a, that the background image is a real picture from one of our classrooms. Currently, we have 65 managers in our current cohort with an average of 14 years of work experience, including a minimum of three years of leadership, any kind of leadership or managerial experience. As you can see from the image, we use state-of-the-art classroom technology and setups in order to facilitate discussion and interaction in class. We make use of case-based learning rather than traditional lectures that you, will, that you would find in local MBA programs. And we want to take you experts in your very specific field from the level of functional expertise to the strategic level. The top quality online experience that we offer is our hybrid uh, format. You can choose if you want to, at every module, you can choose if you want to participate online or on site. And for online, ex for the online experience, um, we have upgraded our uh, whole campus with studio grade microphone microphones capturing lecturers and your participants because you don't want to solely hear your listen to your uh, professors. You would uh, also like to listen to your fellows, I guess. We've invested in large screens and high quality cameras to capture all the statements being made in the classrooms. We've created physical virtual breakout rooms um, for support teams. Support teams are an essential part, an essential uh, backbone of our uh, modules because you will be placed in, in teams, in very diverse teams. There, will, there won't be a team with people coming from the same country, with the same professional background, with the same language, linguistic background, so you will be exposed to diversity. This is a promise that we can make. Um, we offer personalized virtual backgrounds and high quality individual support. These are the virtual backgrounds that we created for online participation. You can um, at one glance see uh, not just the, uh, the faces and the images of your fellows, but also their names, of course. So you can attribute, reattribute like everybody who's uh, telling, who's giving a statement and also the team colors, so you know uh, who's belonging to what team. Speaking of financing, uh, tuition is 29,000 euros because of um, the financial endowment. We are passing on that financial endowment that we have to our participants, to our students, because we, don't, we want to democratize higher education. We want to encourage people to join the executive MBA who are coming from NGOs, who are coming from less economic, less developed countries, who are coming from industries who are not paying that well, etc. Um, because they, those people have stories to tell as well. Um, the whole um, the tuition covers all credits for tuition, but not, of course, accommodation and travel costs. For um, accommodation, we have special rates negotiated with 
partner hotels in Vienna and Budapest, ranging from the budget to the luxur luxury uh, level. And we have negotiated discounts for flights with Austrian Airlines and Lufthansa Group for your flights uh, to Vienna and Budapest. So we invite you to join the open world. Um, all applications are already open via our website. I encourage everybody to apply as soon as possible. First of all, we have an early bird discount at the moment. And um, even more important, we have a scum first serve policy. So the sooner you apply, the sooner you're able to uh, secure your study seat. The application deadline is March 27th, but as I already said, it's uh, better for you to apply the sooner because you can um, uh, reserve your study seat. Through our website, you're um, very much welcome to um, book a one-on-one -on -one consultation with me. I already joined, uh, shared the link in the email that I shared with you. Um, if you have any specific questions that you that uh, we cannot talk about on uh, tonight, um, so you can just book a one-on-one -on -one consultation with me. Um, that's the easiest thing to get in touch if you're joining online. So um, I would like to move on from the formal program presentation part to um, the part where you have the opportunity to meet people who have actually done the program or are in the program because it's of course it's one thing to hear about the program from us from the executive mba program office where everybody's so much committed to this program but i think it's more authentic more realistic to hear about the program from people who have actually done the program or are in the program i would like to introduce lee uh, kamolins head of evaluation at uh, quaparelli Simmons here in London to uh, uh, to uh, share a few words with us and tell us why you joined CU back then. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thomas. Um, hello, everyone. Um, it's, it's actually quite terrifying talking in front of real people um, after you know two years. So uh, do bear with me. And hello to everyone online. Um, so I uh, joined the CU Ember program um, this year, actually. Um, we, over the summer, held our first in-person classes in Budapest, um, which was, you know, actually sort of quite a, um, I don't know, quite a scary experience in some ways, seeing like physical environment, but um, but was, you know, so amazing. And I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. But, but to sort of answer um, Thomas's question about like why I joined the program. Um, so um, my background, I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about that. So. I come from Australia originally. I've lived in London for more than 15 years now. This is home. Um, and my background was um, in Australia. I worked in um, an anti-corruption organization where we dealt with police corruption and was sort of in interlinked with the government. Um, and, and then we sort of um, evolved into a, an organization that also looked at human rights issues. Um, when I came to London, I started um, working in Whitehall in the civil service. Um, working in the education department, actually, and the company I now work for um, is a private company working in the education sector. Um, so all throughout my career, I've sort of had this uh, sort of narrative, really, of sort of driving these sort of socially sort of driven causes um, in my career. And when, I, I, you know, throughout the pandemic, I was sort of thinking about what I don't know, I need to sort of do something, you know, sitting here wasting all my time, go back to study, should I, I don't know, do a PhD, should I do an MBA or whatever. Um, and, I, and I came across this program and, you know, it really sort of spoke to, you know, those values of the core to me, you know, um, I, I, I'm sure we'll talk about it more as the night goes on, but like this concept of the open world and the way it is integrated into the program is something I haven't seen in any other program. Um, so the company I work for um, actually works in the higher education space. So you know, this is a uh, um, you know area that's you know so close to my work anyway. Um, um, I, I found when I joined um, sort of joined the program and got there, I, you know, I didn't really know what to expect. Um, you know, it was sort of I don't. When I arrived there, I found like everyone sort of was really sort of thinking in the same way as me. You know, I in a lot of other programs where you get a lot of people who you know are basically there to make as much money as possible and you know, screw screw over the rest of the world or whatever every single person in the program really seemed quite socially minded in their approach and you know wanted to change the world 
Um, so, um, you know, when I arrived in Buda, well, even before we arrived in Budapest, a lot of us connected online. And, you know, we've got people who work in, you know, like investment banking, in the human rights sector, someone who works like in shipbuilding, in, um, you know, sort of indigenous rights in um, North America, um, you know, someone who works for, um, like an LGBT, um, you know, um, organization. We've got, I don't know, people who work in, of course, I, I can't even think, you know, it's sort of every possible extreme you can think of. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the cultural sector, people who work in trade, in, um, you know, the airline industry, in, you know, just e everything I could even imagine. Um, and I found, like, when we come together and share our experiences on campus, I don't know, I, I almost feel like I've learned more from, than I have from the program. I, I probably shouldn't say that, but you know, this has been so sort of amazing. And I think it's happened in a way that wouldn't in a lot of other universities that I've sort of dealt with in the past. Um, so that's sort of a bit, bit of my story of sort of why I chose this program. And, you know, I sort of anticipated having this sort of diversity in, um, um, you know, in, in people I would meet, um, but, but it sort of exceeded you know, my expectations in so many ways. Um, it, it was interesting when um, Thomas was going through the faculty and talking about some of the faculty who teach um, over the summer. Um, they had a uh, course with Joy, who was one of the finance lecturers. And to be honest, um, you know, finance is not really my area. I don't get it, but I, but I do now after this course. Um, it was something I thought would be quite boring and I found actually it was really, really interesting. And I, I, I sort of can't believe someone can make that type of topic so fascinating. So, so you know, I, I think the stories, you know, is sort of reflecting on really uh, sort of true in that way. Um, um, yeah, so that's, I don't know, that's a little bit of my story. Is there anything else you'd like me to talk I'm about? I'm about what you just shared. I mean, you just joined in, in, in August in a very diverse group. Yeah, yeah, and, and of course, you know, sort of, I, I don't know, there was a little bit of anxiety leading up to it because no one knew whether they would be able to travel out and so forth, um, but, you know, we all connected online and even the people who haven't, for you know, because they're in some part of the world or whatever, where they couldn't physically attend on campus, you know, we've sort of kept these sort of, um, sort of virtual networking things going among ourselves, even outside of the sort of full of structures to make sure, you know, everyone is sort of connected and sort of drawing on those experiences as we go through so um so it's sort of uh yeah i don't know it's been a fascinating experience for me so far uh, yeah yes yeah so um we've just sort of been you know we went through the sort of courses over the summer in, in our um, cohort we had finance data accounting sort of control and accounting um very intense modules. yeah it, it was very <laughs> very intense um there's sort of alongside it, a lot of social stuff that goes on as well and you know some of it informally obviously but like each night after class for instance there's like we had drinks reception on the um rooftop in um budapest which was just so beautiful among the sort of rooftops there and and, and like i was saying to thomas when i was out there actually this is actually an added bonus you know it's pretty cool getting to travel out to these cities and you know have an excuse to when you know maybe you know, it's not always the best thing to do uh, being traveling at the moment. Just, so, just to clarify, yeah, the, the yeah. program usually doesn't start in August. We needed to start because of, because of the corona crisis, because like in March, we weren't allowed to even enter campus. So we kind of moved the whole start to August. But your program will start in uh, April, the end of April, the beginning of May 2021. 22. 22, 22, yes, 22, of course, yes. So, um, yeah, so we're just getting ready now to sort of, you know, starting our reading and preparation for the the end of the month. Which takes place in a month. In a month, yeah. Yeah. No, 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 no less than weeks. a month. Yes, yes. <laughs> my goodness. So, uh, yeah, I better get reading and catching up on that. Actually, um, yeah. um, um, the other thing I, I suppose I've got, I've got asked by a few people in the past, so I've just mentioned as well, is um, sort of the what is it like trying to do this and you know, work, you know, I, I work in a really senior role in my organization and, you know, at the best of times, you know, it's so intense. Um, and I, do, I, I think the way this course is structured so in those modules, you can sort of just as much as possible take yourself out, you know, focus on it in that way. I mean, it made it pretty intense, but it was sort of, 
I don't know in a good way. I came, I came out of those summer modules. I mean, probably never feeling so exhausted in my life, <laughs> but but it was sort of in a good way. Like I sort of felt like my mind had sort of like expanded or something. And you know, I, I think everyone else was saying the same thing. So yeah. So I I mean, you know, I'm such an advocate for this program. <laughs> I'm loving it so far. So um, yeah, happy to answer. I mean, the advantage of that total immersion is that you would only have to to commute to the modules like three times a year, and not every yeah. second or third weekend. You know, that's, that's yeah, part of yeah, ex exactly. Yeah. yeah, so it's sort of yeah condenses the sort of painful bits around your work <laughs> um, into like you know manageable chunks and. And you know, certainly leading up to that first module, which is you know, the summer one's quite intense because it's you know ten days or whatever. Um, there's so much preparation to do and so forth. In your case, in, in our case, but, but <laughs> for the early ones. Um, but but after we had done that, like the first time was sort of a bit of a panic, like oh my god, how am I going to do this? But the preparing for the next one, I'm finding so easy. You know, I think once you've sort of got through that initial sort of oh my god, how do I deal with this? You just get into this rhythm of you know, sort of, I, I don't know, managing it all it just sort of happens. So, um, and, you know, I, I think everyone else is sort of reflecting in that way as well when I've been talking to the colleagues in the course. So, um, yeah, sorry, I feel like I'm just ranting. No, no, I mean, I just want to yeah. add that we're always here if you need any assistance or help. I mean, but the yeah. learning part, <laughs> yeah. we can do. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 you know, it, although like all the sort of faculty and everyone have been, you know, really supportive like we sort of haven't needed it because I, I don't know everyone in the course sort of we sort of created these networks sort of so quickly and yeah you know, we do sort of have these formal support groups but the whole cohort um, for instance are just constantly sort of sharing information and sort of sharing you know helping each other if they're sort of struggling with bits and pieces of the program so it's um and you know this is where that diversity of the cohort I think really helps because you know we have people who do know what they're talking about with finance already and can sort of help us through those bits and you know i might know more about i, I don't know the sort of leadership components and can help people with those so so it's i, I don't know it's sort of it's telling it together quite well i, I, I find so far so, yeah thank you very much cool, cool. Thank you. yeah thanks katarina are you there yes hello now we oh, can yeah. you. thank you very much for joining us tonight um how are you doing? Where are you based yeah. in the United Kingdom? Are you in London? Thank you, Thomas. No, I'm based in Berkshire in, in Maidenhead. And sorry for not being there uh, in London because I have a bad luck with London recently. So if I want to drive, there is no petrol around. And if I want <laughs> to take a train, it's canceled. So <laughs> sorry for that. But yes, I'm absolutely delighted to be invited to this event. I actually share my own experience. Well, thank you for, for joining us. You can talk about the alumni experience, um, your individual experience. Um, Katarina Kim is founder of WizMind here. In yes, so I have my own just, company. If you could yes. uh, briefly introduce yourself and give us, you know, a, a, a background on uh, yes. and why you chose CEU back then. Yeah, sure. I actually joined CEO, uh, the Executive Business MBA program in 2012. And that time I used to work only for uh, multinational companies like Johnson Johnson and uh, at the pharmaceutical sector. And uh, well, I used to work in HR. And after the graduation, I think that my mindset has significantly changed into more entrepreneurial. And then I started to think about my purpose and also about them uh entrepreneurship as well so i actually uh, i'm a strong believer uh in a portfolio career that's why i have like kind of two two lives two business lives so i own the company with mind which is actually um uh, supporting businesses um and um marginalized groups of people uh, with mental well-being and also with um, leadership and soft skills um, coaching, because I started to be uh, interested in the fourth industrial revolution and the future of work. So I started to think about people getting ready for the significant changes uh, in the future with the age of artificial intelligence. So it actually caught my mind and um, interest. Like meanwhile, I'm also working for the fashion industry as a global learning and development manager, working with 22 countries, working remotely, 100%. And yeah, so I have two careers at the moment.
Yeah. Uh, can you tell us about the um, alumni network that you are part of or that uh, uh, that you um, were able to uh, enjoy? Yeah, sure. So this is the this is my favorite part actually because I um, still I adore all of the professors, including Professor Agua as well, sure, and Professor uh, Joy. Uh, but I think that. The, the most important and interesting thing was about the network that I actually created during those years. And I, I'm still in contact with those people that are still my friends. We help each other. Uh, we have, uh, I think that we had 15 countries in the cohort that time. And since that time, I think people moved uh, even more. So people from Budapest move move to Asia, people from Asia move to Europe and so on. So we're still in the contact. We created our uh, LinkedIn group and Facebook group. So we uh, were messaging each other and it's quite fascinating. A lot of them opened um, either non-commercial organizations or uh, their own business, which is really great. And I think since 2012, yeah, I had some, um, some examples of really nice um, businesses that they created. I also know that some of my um, classmates, they also became kind of teachers or their mentors in this uh, bootcamp for startups in CEU. So it's also very interesting and uh, pleasant to see them also mentoring and teachers, teaching new, um, like new, new startups. Uh, you, you just mentioned the diversity in the group. Um, I can uh, proudly um, report that we, in the current cohort, we have 35 nationalities. And uh, we um, not only have diversity when it comes to different nationalities or cultural, cultural backgrounds, we also have a very diverse background when it comes to um, professional backgrounds with people coming from culture, arts, um, entrepreneurship, uh, climate change activism, human rights activism, um, from the corporate world, investment banking, consultancy, um, from the medical field. Um, so uh, gender identities, um, age uh, ranges. So it's a really diverse uh, program. Um, yes, <clears throat> this is one of the best parts, you know, when we had people from, uh, from NGOs, uh, as well as uh, multinational companies and small businesses. It was really a very diverse group, not only because of the locations, but also the diversity of mindset that we had. So we learned a lot from each other, especially for those people who, who like me, who used to work in a corporate environment. It was very interesting to, to know other um, you know, points of view on sustainability and also um, like loads of things that we learned that time. So I see that you have data management and data anal uh, analytics course as well. We didn't have this before. So. Exactly. We have uh, big data management, we have network economy. Um, so um, very um, zeitgeist um, uh, topics that you would need to understand in order to make better leadership decisions. Um, Ekaterina, thank you so much for joining us tonight for uh, uh, for giving us your time. Thank you very much. I would like to move on to Professor Thank Yusuf you. Akbar. Great to have you. Uh, Professor Yusuf Thank Akbar, you. Associate Professor of Strategy, he has published over 40 journals, articles, uh, four books and numerous contributions to academic and professional research in strategy and international business. He's founding editor of the International Journal of Emerging Markets and an advisor to governmental authorities. Uh, his consulting and professional references include Citibank, Deutsche Telekom, Siemens, Texas Instruments, and Toyota. And he will happily talk about Joe Biden's antitrust counter-revolution. Thank you very much, Yusuf. The floor is yours. Thanks so much, Thomas. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, Catherine, I'm very sorry about the UK, but unfortunately, my country uh, is the first country ever to impose economic sanctions upon itself. So I'm sorry you can't get uh, fuel. Everything's fine here in the European Union, however. Oh, okay. Oh, my God. Uh, so you know, I guess it's not the reason. things get really bad, welcome back to the European Union. We're happy to have you here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my, my, my intention this evening is uh, is not to talk about the uh, uh, the, the, the lies and, uh, and, um, and uh, various other bad behaviour of the British government as regards Brexit. I'm actually here to talk about a very, very interesting development in the United States, which is very much underneath uh, the radar screen. 
uh, just to give you just a little bit of background to uh, to why I'm so interested in this particular topic. Um, uh, many, 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 many moons ago when I was doing my doctoral work, I actually did my focus on uh, antitrust and competition policy, and especially looking at the relationships between um, how national competition policies relate to international trade agreements and uh, and so on. So I, I so I've always kept sort of kept an interest in antitrust policy alongside other research interests, which I've taken on subsequent to finishing my doctorate um, uh, two decades ago. So, um, and, you know, and again, I think, it, you know, I think even, even the most well-informed people who follow the news um, will often get kind of, you know, uh, wrapped up in the culture war nonsense. Uh, they may get distracted by, you um, the U.S. military-industrial complex and 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 the various kinds of sort of you know bits going on around there to for the U.S. military to maintain the eight hundred billion dollars a year it gets from U.S. taxpayers, but actually there's some really interesting stuff going on in the background behind that. And one area in particular is what's happening with U.S. antitrust laws. Um, and I'd like to just spend a few minutes with you this evening talking to you about exactly uh, what that means. Um, on July 9th of, of this year, um, President Biden um, called a press conference in the White House where he announced an executive order, uh, an executive order related to promoting competition um, and economic welfare in the US economy. Um, and he opened his, uh, his, his press conference with the following statement. We're now 40 years into an experiment of letting giant corporations accumulate more and more power. I believe that experiment failed. Now, what's the experiment he's referring to? The experiment he's referring to has been uh, a very important shift that occurred in the way in which the US government seeks to enforce competition policy in the United States. So what I want to do now is sort of give you a little bit of um, background on, on US antitrust policy, looking at different phases and then uh, we'll focus in specifically on what this executive order um, is going to do and how it's going to affect antitrust policy. And then perhaps at the end, I've got some closing thoughts on what this may mean, um, not just for uh, American companies in the United States, but also what it may mean internationally and, and whether or not we're going to see a kind of new convergence of competition policies um, in major jurisdictions. Now, why does Joe, Joe Biden believe uh, that you know, multi, uh, large corporations have too much economic power and this has failed? Well, let me just give you four data points uh, as a starting point. Now, since 1980, when this 40-year experiment in antitrust policy started, um, price cost markups have tripled, and that's taking inflation into account. So that's a, that's, so that's a pretty extraordinary uh, um growth in profitability for corporations. Uh, however, the rate of new business formation has fallen by 50% in that time. Um, in the year two, uh, compared to the year 2000, industry concentration, what that means is you know, the, the, the market share across industries in the United States held by a relatively small number of companies, typically four or five companies, is 75% higher than it was 20 years ago. And during that same period, uh, wages have fallen by more than 15% in a number of sectors which are important to the economy, transportation, healthcare, education, uh, manu uh, uh, automotive manufacturing, agriculture, and so on. So in other words, what we've been seeing over this 40 year period is increasing profits for companies and falling wages for workers, even <coughs> though, uh, U.S. labor productivity has been rising almost continuously during that period, right? So workers have been becoming more productive. They get paid less, but large corporations make more profits. And this is exactly what Joe Biden's getting at in his statement at the start of his press conference in July. So I'm just going to give you a quick run through of sort of the historical development of U.S. antitrust law. And I think there are kind of three, three distinct phases, which we'll, we'll, we'll talk about. And then I want to talk about the kind of intellectual origins of Biden's approach uh, to antitrust. And I want to introduce you to three very influential people in the United States government um, and who belong to the so-called uh, New Brandeisian 
uh, antitrust movement. And again, I'll explain exactly what that means. Then I'm going to give you a little bit of insight into what are the key areas of the Biden competition agenda and how it's going to affect companies in the United States, but also give some thoughts on how companies could respond uh, to the executive order, focusing on sort of this area of what we call corporate political activity or, or non-market strategy, which is a research area that I write a lot about. And then I've got you know two or three questions I'd like to conclude with. So the United States was the very first uh, in uh, major industrialized economy in the world to introduce competition laws. And it starts at the late 19th century, early 20th century with two uh, acts of Congress. First, the Sherman Act and then the Clayton Act. The Sh briefly, because this is not a uh, competition law class, uh, the Sherman Act kind of focused on two main areas, I would say. The first is um, abuse of monopoly. Uh, and you know, there's a historical context for that, of course. And the second area are restrictive business practices. So you know, like price fixing, cartels, uh, you know, sort of um, uh, limit, li limiting uh, distribution um, agreements and uh, and the like. And then the Clayton Act was focusing on essentially merger control. So looking at what what should government do when you know when companies want to merge and combine their assets, right? And, and, and why was the Sherman Act and the Clayton Act introduced by US Congress? Well, it, it, it comes at a time, and this is kind of interesting when we think about the current situation at the start of the 21st century, um, or two, two decades in, I should say, rather. Um, in the United States at the turn of the 20th century, the US economy was growing very, very quickly. The country was expanding new, you know, into, into newer geographies within the United States. And of course, there were these very large conglomerates that developed, the so-called robber barons, the Rockefellers, um, and so on. And US Congress recognized that with economic monopolization came political power. And so they decided to introduce laws uh, to limit the power of companies to abuse their economic monopolies, if you like. And of course, you know, one way to getting monopoly is merger and acquisition, which is why the Clayton Act comes into force. There's a gentleman on the on the side of the screen here, Robert Bork, who I'm going to introduce to you right now. Now, uh, some of some of you may be old enough to remember that uh, Ronald Reagan becomes president of the United States in 1980. You know, at the same time as Margaret Thatcher becomes prime minister in the UK, and within the Anglo-Saxon world, you know, they were very much kind of leading a sort of revolution or a reaction to the previous. Uh, four dec well, three and a half decades of interventionist policies in major industrialized economies. You can think about in the United States with uh, the uh, Roosevelt, um, LBJ, and so on. And in the UK, you can think about uh, sort of fairly liberal conservative governments and labor governments uh, through nationalization of assets. Anyway, so Ronald Reagan comes to power in, in the 1980s, and he promises to kind of free up the competitive spirit of the United States. And I think much of his um, public uh, musings, thoughts, speeches, and certainly the people around him were heavily influenced by a, by a group of economists who emerged to be very influential at the University of Chicago in the 1970s. Uh, you, probably you've all heard of Milton Friedman. He was probably one of the most influential of those economists, but not the only one. And there was a very famous lawyer, Robert Bork, who uh, Ronald Reagan actually uh, nominated uh, to become Supreme Court Justice. Um, he was rejected by, uh, by the US Senate because at that time it was dominated by the Demo uh, uh, Democratic Party. Um, but nevertheless, Robert Bork um, was the brain, uh, you know, the brainchild behind the, the following idea. You know, monopoly by itself isn't harmful, right? So monopoly can be harmful if a monopolist decides to abuse their position, but not, not, not per se harmful. And in fact, there are lots of reasons why markets will be able to essentially prevent um, monopolies from abusing their position, because if they do abuse their position, new entrants come in, they take market share and the monopolist loses its power. And in fact, they, they also said that you know, market fragmentation, you know, too many relatively small players led to inefficient behavior of firms. So they, they couldn't scale up, they couldn't get their average costs down, and therefore prices were higher, profits were, 
were smaller and, and effectively with the Reagan administration and, and very much continued by the Clinton administration. Uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, George H.W. Bush and, and Barack Obama, to be, to be, brute, to be honest with you. Um, there was basically a suspension of antitrust policy activism. So all of the laws that had been passed by U.S. Congress that were on the, that were on the statute book, um, essentially were, were, were suspended in terms of um, enforcement. And, of course, during this period, when the Republicans had control of the U.S. Senate, uh, they appointed a number of uh, free market judges to the federal bench, which is also important, and I'll come back to that later on. When it comes to mergers, um, I, would, I would characterize it more or less as saying that the uh, US Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission, which are the two key federal agencies in the United States who are there to kind of deal with uh, managing industry concentration, more or less took their hands off the wheel. Uh, and we're not actively going after proposed mergers to try and block them. Uh, a quick, a quick sidestep under the U.S. constitutional system: uh, if if a federal agency such as the Fe uh, federal uh, Fe uh, Federal Trade Commission wants to block a proposed merger, uh, they can't block it. They have to go to a federal court to get a judgment to block it. Right. So that's kind of separation of powers argument. And so essentially, the Federal Trade Commission stopped trying to go to the courts to prevent mergers from happening. So that's the kind of second phase. And then, then as we, you know, as we enter the 21st century, I think something very, very interesting happens uh, in the structure of the US economy. And, and what I mean here, and this is where my work in strategy comes into play, I think there's a fundamental shift in what you might call sort of dominant business models. And, a, and an increasing shift away from what you would call traditionally vertically integrated industries, petroleum, Manu um, automotive manufacturing, consumer electronics, fast moving consumer goods, so, so, so good products and services that we kind of take for granted and we've been, we can consume continuously towards what we call kind of um, laterally orchestrated um, ecosystem or platform uh, business models, right? Where network effects uh, play a very important role in explaining competitive dynamics. And I think these new platform business models, you know, so you're thinking about the emergence of Google, you're thinking about Amazon, you're thinking about the arrival of Apple uh, on the scene and so on. These new platform business models um, really challenge traditional antitrust thinking. Um, because what we were seeing with these, uh, with these new platform business models was that prices were continually falling. Now, if you take the view of people like Robert Bork, that's a good thing or we shouldn't do anything about it. But then a, 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 a new group of scholars emerge, which are the intellectual underpinning of the Biden approach uh, to antitrust that he articulated in the executive order this year. And I want to I single out three, figure, three very important figures here. Uh, the first is a gentleman called Tim Wu. Um, you may have heard of him before. He was the, um, the, the thought leader who, who developed the concept of net neutrality, right? So in other words, um, uh, owners of uh, internet infrastructure, like cable companies, for example, or, or, network, uh, or in, net telecoms infrastructure, um, they shouldn't discriminate uh, between entities that want to uh, distribute their content through their network, right? So whether or not whether you're NBC or an independent website, you should be able to have the same quality of access to the uh, you know to the cables as anyone else, right? Uh, and again, you know this is a very important sort of uh, way of thinking about monop uh, monopoly power because it, you know we know you know, it's sort of basic economics that large-scale networks are typically what we call public goods. In other words, it really doesn't make sense having too many competing networks. You're going to have maybe one or two networks that compete with each other. And of course, if, if any of these companies decide they don't just want to provide infrastructure, but they also want to provide content, then you have a serious monopoly problem because of the network effects, right? So you get locked into a network. You also get locked into the content that's provided by the network. And Tim Wu kind of stood up and said, you know, uh, this isn't a good idea. We need to create laws which guarantee equal access and speed, bandwidth speed, uh, to everybody, irrespective of their size, right? So that's Tim Wu. Um, the, the lady in the middle is, is, a, uh, is a British uh, woman called Lena Khan, who, a uh, very, very young person, she, um, 
she's now uh, Biden's uh, FTC chair um, in her late 30s. And um, she wrote a very influential article in competition law circles in the Yale Law Review called the Amazon Paradox. And the paradox is the following. Um, as a user of Amazon, there's some people that buy stuff on Amazon. They're all, they're so cheap. They're cheap, typically cheaper for most items than you would find in traditional stores, right? And so, you know, from a consumer perspective, that kind of, that's a good thing, right? Because essentially we're getting things for cheaper. But she said, here's the problem. When you deal with these kinds of networks, you've got the other side of the market, right? If you look at the way workers are treated, right? If you look at the way suppliers to Amazon are treated, Amazon isn't necessarily abusing consumers, they're abusing their suppliers. And that's an important issue that we need to face up to. And I'll come back to some of the actions she's already tried to take in respect of these platform business models. And then the last person I'd like to bring to your attention is a gentleman called Jonathan Cantar, who this summer was nominated by, by, by Joe Biden to be the US Assistant Attorney General with his expertise, with, with specialization for antitrust policy. He's currently being um, going through the confirmation process in the US Senate um, right now. So these are three very important figures in the so-called neo-Brandeisian um, movement. Now, what is the neo-Brandeisian movement? Um, I, I would say they are closer to the pre-1980s view of antitrust as a starting point. But I think I'd, I'd also go, go a little bit further than that. And I would say um, they're not just focused on corporate power and monopoly. I think they're also very interested in how corporate power increases economic inequality, right? So an explicit factor in understanding competitive dynamics is, you know, we may have more competition, prices may be falling, but does economic inequality rise because of excessive competition, if you like? I think another thing is that they're really focused on these network effects that I've just referred to, right? So this, the two-sided market, right? So the market for goods, consumers get cheaper, but the market for inputs, uh, where workers, uh, suppliers may, you know, may be abused by these large um, platform business models. I mean, you, you can think of a similar situation with uh, Google Alphabet, right? I mean, Google Alphabet is essentially a digital advertising company. The lion's share of its revenue, more than 80% comes from its ad serve um, technology, right? Uh, for Google search. And again, you know, they have a very opaque auctioning system. And so again, although it's free for us, the user to go searching, the argument is, is that, you know, essentially, it's almost impossible for traditional advertising and publishers to compete uh, with Google search uh, to get the attention of, of people. And sometimes the prices you have to pay to get on Google search become incredibly uh, unaffordable. Facebook in a similar way. Um, and I think the last aspect of the neo-Brandeisian movement is this idea that in when we think about you know, anti-competitive behavior, we shouldn't just be focused on consumer protection. We should also be focusing on wage growth uh, for workers. So what, what does this executive order actually comprise? So I think the first thing to emphasize here on this executive order is it's basically not, not, not a kind of narrow attempt to focus on competition law and antitrust policy. It's a government-wide coordinated executive order, uh, which calls on multiple agencies in the federal government to address you know, the, the alleged failings of antitrust enforcement since the 1980s. And what does this include? I mean, th th there's, there's, a, there's many items there, but I, I just want to highlight uh, six. The first is um, an enhanced merger review process. So a kind of reinvigoration of pre-1980s merger review practices. Um, going after non-compete clauses in employment co contracts. This is a number that may, may, may astonish you. Now, you know, you, I'm sure you can imagine that, you know, where knowledge workers are concerned, you may have a non-compete clause in an employment contract. So if you decide to leave a company as, as a head of research, uh, you might not be able to work for your competitors for a certain period of time for obvious reasons. In fact, in the US economy today, 60% of all US workers are subject to such agreements, going from head of research to working in McDonald's, right? And so the uh, the executive order calls for basically the ending of these non-compete clauses. Um, another fairly egregious um, business practice that's been allowed to continue without any um, antitrust enforcement is where 
pharmaceutical firms that had patents for molecules and drugs, but those patents have expired, have been routinely paying generic producers to not produce the formally patented drug in order to maintain resale prices of their now out of patent uh, drugs. And again, you know, from a consumer perspective, that means you pay more for your drugs. It's not good for um, good, good, good for consumers. Um, they're going to re they're reintroducing net neutrality, which was removed when Donald Trump becomes president of the United States, right? So when the Fed Federal Communications Commission, um, the, you know, the, the, the commissioners are changed under Trump, that three to two vote, they basically got rid of net neutrality. They're reintroducing that with this executive order. Um, there's another important area. I think this is very political, which is looking at selective and exclusive agreements for the aftermarket repair of agricultural machinery, which, you know, perhaps you and I doesn't seem to be very important, but in key states in the United States, in the Midwest, this is a very important issue. Essentially, the US government has allowed producers of agricultural machinery, John Deere and the like, to essentially have selective and exclusive repair services. So farmers can't have a choice of repair services. They have to go to um, uh, authorized repair shops, which of course raises the cost of repair of machinery. Um, and the last area, uh, which is related to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which was created after 2000, the 2008 financial crisis, but again, was significantly weakened by the Trump administration, um, is that they're, in, they're introducing measures to make it much easier for customers to switch financial service providers. So what does this mean um, for companies? I think there are three big takeaways here for companies, right? If you want to merge in the US, there's a much greater probability that your merger proposal is going to be much more seriously analyzed and the probability of ending up in court is going to be significantly higher. And I think that's where digital platforms have to be very, very careful. Um, Google hasn't actually invented anything in the last five years. Any new idea that Google has released to the market has been through acquisition. We know about Facebook acquiring Instagram and WhatsApp. Again, Facebook has not done anything seriously innovative in the last five years. So these company strategies, which are based around acquiring new ideas, those things might become much more, much more difficult in the future. Um, as I mentioned before, I think that you know, going after consumer protection in a much more broad sense, I think is going to have a major impact on industries where they've had a fairly cozy set of relationships which have led to higher passes being prices being passed on to consumers um and i think you know the ending of of non-compete clauses um may end the period of wage suppression which you know has basically affected one in five u.s workers in the last decade so if we look at it from a company's perspective you know how i mean clearly the executive order is going to have a negative impact on companies because with the reintroduction of a much more aggressive antitrust policy, they're going to find that many of the things they're able to do over the last 40 years is going to become much, much more difficult. So what can the companies do to kind of respond to this significant shift in uh, US antitrust law? And I, I, I'm borrowing... Um, two kind of concepts, uh, one from a, a very influential study done by Hillman and Hitt in 1999, and another perhaps less influential study done by myself and my colleague, Maciej Kishlovsky, uh, uh, looking at uh, corporate bliss of activity. And what Hillman and Hitt did in 1999 is they classified different kinds of corporate political activity into information strategies where companies um, act as experts or technocratic leaders and provide information uh, to regulators and politicians. Uh, financial strategies, which in the US, of course, is very straightforward. That's, you know, uh, it's straightforward giving money to politicians for their election campaigns. It's basically corruption, right? And then you've got constituency building strategies, which is where companies work together through industry associations to influence politicians and regulators. Um, and then myself and my colleague, Maciej Kishlowski, we, we, we try to classify this kind of corporate political activity in, in, into whether it's a reactive uh, approach, posture, or a proactive posture, right? So just again, for the purposes of this discussion, because there are many more things that companies can do, I just want to bring up four 
areas which which are which you know which kind of stand out um you know i think the one thing that companies can do um is they must enter into a very very um lively and active dialogue with the federal trade commission uh to limit changes now although lena khan is chair of the ftc there are other commissioners so you know th th there are ways in which companies can kind of use their technocratic expertise to kind of influence uh, members of the FTC to kind of limit some of the changes that Lena Khan would 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 like to introduce. Um, if you're a competition lawyer in the United States, this is the this is great. I mean, there's going to be a massive increase in the demand for um, competition law firms, and I suspect the U.S. government is going to be hiring a lot of antitrust lawyers in, in, in the years ahead. Um, I think when it comes to dealing with the public debate and also dealing with U.S. Congress. I mean, obviously, that's going to take place through the media. It's going to take place through elections. So this is financial strategies. It's also going to take place in terms of built, creating these kinds of, you know, these sort of grassroots uh, political action committees and so on uh, that can kind of, you know, um, frame the debate in a broader sense, because, of course, you know, there are midterm elections in 2022, another presidential election in 2024. So you know, th th this, is in, this is an opportunity for companies to kind of... Um, have their word said and then i think the last area is you know that the, the companies can basically just you know preempt federal action by removing or modifying current labor contract practices which might take the heat um off off companies so the first two are, are largely reactive right kind of dealing with what's been handed to them and i think the second two are much more proactive right so companies can go out there and set the agenda frame the debate and they can take actions uh, before the federal government uh, steps in. I think there are two caveats to this story about impending change in antitrust law. I think the first thing is, as I explained to you, I, under, the, under the separation of powers in the US Constitution, federal agencies can't just take actions without often having to go to a court. And within antitrust law, it's absolutely necessary. So many judges may be sympathetic to the, you know, the 1980s antitrust posture that I described at the start today. And I think that's that that's worth noting. So even if the FTC makes the case, if the judge is is not is sort of, you know, predisposed to those arguments, they could reject those arguments. And, you know, the, the Republicans have been putting a lot of conservative judges onto the federal bench in the last, you know, cup, the last 10 years. Um, and I think also US Congress, uh, you know, let's just say after the next midterm elections in 2022, you know, perhaps the House um, becomes uh, Republican and maybe they can, you know, flip the Senate. It's, you know, the map is not as as good as it was in the last midterm elections for the Republicans, but that could happen. And in that situation, of course, U.S. Congress uh, could introduce measures uh, to limit the ability of U.S. federal agencies to enforce provisions, particularly when you're looking at sort of the um, the confirmation of key key people in the agencies, right, because the Senate has to... Um, confirm those so they could kind of slow walk those processes making it much harder for these things to be introduced so you know I'll, I'll, you know I'll, I'll finish with um with three questions um first of all does this new biden approach herald um a more global change in uh antitrust laws i mean we know that the u.s is historically a leading indicator of change so when the americans in the 1980s start having a much more permissive antitrust policy, other countries followed suit later on. So, you know, if we go the other way, if the pendulum swings the other direction, do we, do we see a similar thing happening elsewhere? Uh, in particular, do we see a convergence between US antitrust laws and EU competition policy, which would be a major change because they're the two most important competition authorities at the moment. I mean, China is becoming more important, but we certainly think of those two as the, the, the big two uh, antitrust agencies. And last but not least, will Lena Khan be able to go after uh, the Silicon Valley tech platforms? Um, I'll give you one data point. Um, Lena Khan has already gone to a federal court asking for the breakup of Facebook. So she's, she's essentially asked the federal court to require Facebook to uh, spin off Instagram and WhatsApp. And this summer, the judgment, the, the, the judgment was handed down by the federal judge, and the judge threw out the case, uh, arguing that, that, that the FTC hadn't proven 
um, that Facebook was a monopoly. But the key point here is a while, while the, the, the initial ruling was disappointing for the FTC, the judge didn't say, don't come back to my courtroom. This is a waste of time. The judge actually said, come back with a better argument. So I suspect that Lena Khan is going to come back with a new, uh, a new argument. And not surprisingly, Facebook has, has publicly called for the recusal of Lena Khan in this case when it comes back because they argue that she's, she's not objective um, about them. Thanks very much. Uh, I hope you found this uh, presentation interesting. And um, Thomas, I don't know whether or not there's going to be time for questions because I know you've got uh, other things to uh, to do. But thank you very much. That's always thank you very much, Yusuf. There's always time for engaging with you. And um, I've put you on on microphone here in on, on site, and people online have uh, uh, shooted in question as well. Um, feel free to to join if you want to engage with uh, Yusuf. Um, the first thing that I um, took away with is like just the whole uh, momentum stand in any context with um, developments in China, or is this a completely isolated thing from from China? Yeah. So, so is is a more interventionist uh, U.S. antitrust policy? Uh, an attempt to respond to the emergence of China's economic power? Is that your question? Yes. That's a good question. Um, my sense is, because uh, I'm not at all an expert on Chinese um, uh, Chinese competition policy, my, se my sense is this is actually part of a broader shift away from kind of the neoliberal project, which Biden referred to, which I think is almost independent of what's going on in China. Um, of course, you know, a more a more proactive U.S. antitrust law can, of course, create opportunities for the U.S. government for industrial policy. So picking winners, promoting um, American companies. Um, but I won't stick my neck out at the moment and say this is there is an explicit link between what's going on in the U.S. right now with competition law in China. Any questions from the audience here? Yeah. Yes. Sorry, do, do you think um, Biden has enough time to to implement the changes? Because four years is quite <laughs> short period of time for such fundamental change. It's, I think, a bit too late. That's a great question. So thank you for that. Well, so, I, so I think the reason why this executive order is so interesting compared with previous executive orders, as implied by your question, is, is that most of the time executive orders in sort of presidential history are used to deal with the fact that Congress hasn't taken action. So the, the best, most recent example is actions taken by Obama to make it easier for um, undocumented um, migrants in the US to get a path to citizenship because the Congress wouldn't reform immigration law. So Biden tried to take action to do that. And of course, the moment Biden, as you suggest by your, your excellent question, the moment Biden steps down, Trump comes in and immigration policy becomes much tougher, right? Exactly right. The thing about this executive order, I think, which is really interesting, which is why I, I decided to sort of do some writing around this, is that this, this does not require new laws. Everything in this executive order that is called for is based upon existing laws that can be enforced without congressional agreement. So the federal agencies have a lot more autonomy in this situation. So it's not like, you know, the current discussions around this um, uh, Build Back Better $2.5 trillion bill that's being discussed right now and this $1 trillion infrastructure bill. This is something that the agencies can get on with right now and can continue to do as long as Biden is president. I hope that answered the question. Did any more questions? Uh, in view of, thank you very much, Yusuf. In view of the time, I would like to proceed to the Q&A session. Um, I've collected some um, questions from um, personal messages. Um, you're free to stay online and uh, um, answer some of those questions if you, if you fancy, Yusuf. So the first question, and I think you're an expert on this, is the question, if there are any exams, what about the thesis? Yeah. Um... So in a, pre in, a, in a previous existence, I was the, uh, the, 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 the co-founder and co-director of this 
uh, executive MBA program. So, um, of course, you know, an MBA program is a general management degree, so it's taught across multiple different disciplines. So depending on what subject you're taking, you're going to get different kind of assessment methods, right? So if you're doing finance and data, of course, yeah, it's likely or accounting, there's probably going to be exams, right? Traditional kind of, you know, sit down, answer the question exams. Uh, but if you're, if you're doing other subjects like leadership, it's much more experiential. The other side is going to be coaching and, and small group interactions. And if you're, if you're taking strategy, then it's case-based. So it's case discussions, um, writing um, strategy documents, uh, and so on. So, this, so it's the, it runs the gamut from traditional exams to experiential, uh, qualitative uh, assignments. Now, when it comes to the thesis, uh, we don't we, we don't have a thesis. Um, we believe that for executives, writing a thesis is not necessarily the most productive use of time. Instead, uh, there's a capstone project, uh, which is an attempt uh, to encourage participants to kind of develop an end of program reflection upon what they've learned during the entire time with us um at the emba and it there are different kinds of um capstone projects you can do uh and i, I thomas are, are there details online about this or is this something that you're going to be making available for people to to read about about the capstone project um yes there is some information on our website um already yes yeah so so i would encourage you to uh, to check that information out on the website because I, I stood down as the, the director of the program a few months ago to take on another more bureaucratic administrative role <laughs> at the university so I'm, I'm less I'm less plugged into the latest developments in the MBA. Um, the next question I received online is about the application process and requirements and um, Yusuf if you allow um, I would like to answer that question. Sure, of course well, you're the expert in that. <laughs> um, so the application um, requirements are pretty straightforward that um, we require applicants to have at least eight years of um, work experience with it, um, at least uh, three years of managerial or leadership experience, um, fluence in English, of course, and um, need, to, need to submit a, a CV and a motivation letter and two references. That shouldn't be a problem in, in to, to, to come up with those documents and an under, undergraduate degree in any kind of uh, field of, of study. Um, the application process starts on our website. Um, it's an online application, 100% online application. Um, you will be asked to enter personal data and um, to upload um, specific documents. And once you have submitted and completed your application, we will uh, revise it for completeness. You will be invited for an, uh, for an interview. And based on, on the score in, in that you have achieved in that interview, you will receive an admission decision. And the whole process only usually takes place, it takes only a couple of weeks um, until the admission decision will be sent to you. As I already said, we have the first come per surf policy. So we are, uh, very much committed to offer a very uh, fast um, admission decision to you. Um, the next question, maybe for you, Yusuf, again, is what is the core of the uh, of the academic program? What leadership? What what's the importance of leadership in the program? You're, can hear. you're muted. 18 months of Zoom and I still am muted. Sorry about that, everybody. Let me start again. Thank you very much. Great question. I mean, this is an executive MBA program. And so obviously, given the level of experience that people have, um, leadership and the development of leadership competences uh, are super important. And the way we've developed the leadership program uh, at, at the EMBA is we it's taught over the three years. If you remember from Thomas's... Um, uh, his slide where he showed you the, the you know the, the way the program runs over the modules um, in the first year it's called good decisions so you know how do you make decisions as a leader the second year are what we call good cultures so how do leaders create effective organizational cultures and then the final year is what we call good life which focuses more on the kind of 
uh, more holistic view of work-life balance. So we're hoping that by the end, well, we're confident rather than hoping, we're confident that by the end of the program, um, as, as practicing managers, uh, as, as already successful people, we're going to help you develop some, some competences and capabilities which will help you do your current leadership roles, but also hopefully give you an opportunity to get promotion and progression within your chosen career. Thank you very much. Uh, in view of the time, I would like to um, come to the last question, which is a very important question usually, which is the question about financial support. We are, as I already mentioned, we have this big financial endowment and we are happy to pass on this financial advantage to our participants through uh, scholarships and fellowships. We offer a variety of financial support. We offer, um, um, first, first of all, the Open World Scholarship, which aims at people who have achieved something or who are working in the field very much aligned with our mission, who have contributed to um, building up to strengthening open societies. Could be in the corporate world, could be in the human rights activist, it could be an NGO, um, but that's kind of the, the focus of, of the scholarship. The second stream is, the second option is um, our NIFE scholarships, as the name already implies. Um, only your income and the country of your residence is taken into consideration. Um, everybody could apply for, for such an EFA scholarship, which is non-competitive and only takes into consideration your income situation, because um, on the international level, it makes a difference if you're a manager in Hungary or in the US or in South Africa um, with regard to your income situation. And the third um, option for financial support are our country-specific merit-based scholarships. We offer a huge variety of, of those merit-based scholarships, for example, international LGBTIQ fellowships or country-specific ones like uh, for business women in uh, Russia, Central Asia, Turkey. Um, for the UK, we offer a, a fellowship for BAME managers and um, another international fellowship is for managers with a disability, etc. Um, if you would like to have um, further consultation on um, financial support, I think this would be a better opportunity to have a one-on-one -on -one consultation with me because it's very delicate and a very personalized um, uh, information that you would that you're likely to share in those meetings. So feel free to book a one-on-one -on -one consultation. The link has all, uh, already been provided in the chat box and people who have joined on site already have the link uh, uh, in, in the email. Um, I would like to uh, thank Lee and Katarina and Yusuf for joining us tonight. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to um, get in touch with me by email or the one-on-one -on -one consultation. Um, thank you everybody for joining us tonight and enjoy your evening. Have a good day. Have a good night.